Good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Gilliland, one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. With me this morning, just like in the days of old of watching Saturday morning cartoons, is Gabby Martin and Mark Zaid, and we're going to talk about Hawkeye Episode 5. Gabby, Mark, how are you each doing? I'm doing good. This episode was amazing. I mean, just so many payoffs, and I'm looking forward to the finale of how they wrap it all up but definitely definitely a highlight mark your reaction i i enjoyed it uh and look i think i enjoy any of these series for the most part uh i i'm still on the fence about the balance between seriousness and kind of the joking aspects of it um i understand why disney does it from the sense of trying to capture different markets, adults versus kids. Uh, But sometimes it's a little bit too much for me. But overall, no, hey, I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to the sixth episode. I hope there's going to be more. I I did have the reaction of, we were right on uh, about the bit and about Eleanor being bad. So that was, uh, I was very excited about that for like, we called it and uh, I knew my, we'll talk about this. I knew Eleanor was bad. It was as soon as Jack was arrested so quickly in like under eight hours of Kate uh, telling mommy about Jack is bad and then the police actually executing an arrest warrant. That's fast. And while we yeah. take that as the first issue for what's necessary for an arrest, uh, to be valid. And Gabby, I think you had some notes and, uh, let's talk about what you need for a valid arrest to take place in New York. Well, you need, you need probable cause first, first of all. Um, so, you know, obviously people can report tips and, and all that kind of stuff, but there has to be some element of, of investigation and looking into it. Um, although, you know, maybe like if we're assuming police, because obviously Armand was murdered several days before. So you would assume that the cops are looking into his murder. Right. Um, so maybe they did have, um, Jacques as a person of interest. Um, and they just happened to coincide with whatever, you know, um, Eleanor told them. Um, but it does seem a little fast that, you know, she provided maybe like some kind of smoking gun information. Um, and then, you know, he's arrested. Um, obviously you need probable cause to obtain a warrant, an arrest warrant, um, that gets signed off by a judge. Um, and that, you know, there has to be a whole kind of, you know, the person has to be read why they're being arrested. They, he obviously needs to be read his Miranda rights. Doesn't seem like that's happened. They're just kind of carting him off out of the apartment um so yeah it seems like there's a lot of steps missed but uh given who the big bad is it would kind of lead us to believe that there are some maybe corrupt steps, um and that maybe eleanor placed a phone call uh to her business partner and he got the wheels moving to get her fiance out of the way although clearly no love lost for eleanor to kind of make her fiance a patsy um <laughs> yeah, there's the story elements, but uh, Mark, turning to your expert with espionage and all those things that go bump in the night, Eleanor Bishop has Bishop Security, which seems to have like Orwellian type powers for like surveillance on people's phones, things that raise like uh, Stored Communication Act issues and privacy rights. Can, what was your reaction in thinking about? What did she turn over and how did she get it to law enforcement for them to cart her fiance away in record time? And I'm trying to remember, I watched the episode only once, but they were uniform New York City cops, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. So uh, one, I think one was civilian, but he, there might have been, maybe both were in civilian attire, but right, they, right. Uh, but they were there. Sure. My first thought was this was likely not going to be New York City law enforcement that would arrest him for the likelihood of crimes that were reported. 
there obviously would be overlap in jurisdiction from criminal activity, even if it's an organized crime standpoint. Obviously, New York City would fight organized crime in the district attorney's office. But given what likely Eleanor is involved with and the big man and all the things uh, that we knew Jack was involved with as the CEO, that's the feds are going to take primary jurisdiction. Then the cop, the New York City would be involved without a doubt, but the feds would I, I can't fathom the feds not taking primary jurisdiction unless New York City kept them out of it purposely, which could go to your corrupt cop standpoint, which would make sense given who the big man is, who I presume I'm not quite sure if we're not saying who this person is or not at this early in our episode, but it would make sense. I, I, I would need to go back and check but the arresting officer looked like the same officer who called Kate about the fire in her apartment. And I don't know. Well, then that, that was just a New York city detective as I recall. And I, I need to verify that, but he looked familiar. So, cause I, I initially thought, are they there about the arson or is it, but again, script flip and Jack is getting arrested. So uh, I would agree that if it was a legitimate arrest, the feds would be like full on doing it. Uh, but that's lightning fast for the feds to come crashing down, uh, in like eight hours <laughs> so or less, uh, for how quickly, uh, he's arrested. So let's get into the other issues. And Gabby, you, you really set a high bar with, uh, <laughs> the the outline here um but we do have a little help from uh steven tolafield who's unavailable this morning but uh, we have kate going full-on crazy ex-girlfriend um <laughs> with again it's very it's very fatal attraction the number of phone calls that she's making to uh to clint can you talk us talk to us about stalking i mean i would tend to disagree with you um i am going to defend kate fully. Uh, she is just trying to get in touch with her mentor. There's a lot going on. Um, and she's a bit of an eager beaver. She's trying to get a hold of Clint, although she does leave him enough messages um, that she fills his inbox. Um, but she may have left those in messages, you know, ahead of time, right? Because she's had that phone number for a while. So it may not have all been at that particular time. Um, we've seen her text the number before, right? Just to kind of like you know, mess with him and his thing is he's going to block her um, if she uses it for non-emergency. So I can see her um, like previously calling the number um, just to kind of like chat with Clint and him ignoring it. Right. Um, and it seems like a really rinky dinky phone. So I don't know how much <laughs> voicemail space it actually has. Um, that all being said, um, you know, obviously several, you know, all states have had stalking laws. Stalking is usually a misdemeanor, um, depending on the state. Um, and in New York city, particularly, um, a person is guilty of stalking in the fourth degree, um, when they, um, engage for no intention, legitimate purpose, um, at a direct conduct directed at a specific person, um, conduct causes reasonable feel, fear of harm, safety of property, um, or safety of a member of their family, um, or the emotional distress, um, the per causing the person to fear for their employment um, is threatened. So there has to be some sort of, it, the kind of underlying theme is that there has to be some sort of fear on the part of the victim, right? That they're, they fear something is being threatened, whether that's their safety, uh, whether it's causing emotional distress. And the fact that Clint isn't checking his voicemail, he doesn't really see this. I doubt he'd just be any more than just generally annoyed by Kate calling him multiple times. I don't think there's an element of stalking um, that you really wouldn't have any sort of stalking charge. Um, but um, what I do find interesting is that uh, Eleanor Bishop, may be guilty of stalking um, because stalking um, in the third degree is 
when you kind of stalk multiple people and have, you know, contacts with multiple people of three or more persons, given the information she's collecting on people leads me to believe that she has some, maybe she's following people. She's obtaining this information somehow. And so she may be guilty of stalking given the amount of contacts she has in illicit illegal information on. Um, so that would be interesting to explore, but Kate's trying to get in touch with her mentor. There is a legitimate purpose, right? Her life is kind of being upended. Um, she's trying to get in touch with him, kind of what she feels is an emergency situation. Um, and I don't think there's any real fear on Clint's part, um, you know, that he's in jeopardy or she's trying to harm him or something. Yeah, Josh, I, I, I may a little bit be with you. If this weren't Disney and Clint has a pet bunny, I'd be concerned. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, the Gen X males are, are, are very, <laughs> very, Since very. This is Disney, the bunny is probably safe. Clint, I will not really go that line, cross that line. She is just an eager millennial trying to get in touch with her mentor. And she just, she's freaking out and panicking and anxious. Um, so I, that, I is, so that is the millennial Clint's perspective. Does, I hope Clint's wife does not have access to his voicemails. <laughs> I, she, she might be cool with this. Like, okay, no, she was definitely freaking out. So I... But but uh, Clint's wife has maturity and experience and understands the stress of this world and go like okay if I were twenty two I too would be freaking out so I understand she but I'm pretty sure Mrs Barton can snap next so I'm pretty I sure mean, she... look, obviously you know we you would always have I think there was always concern anyone watching about a relationship between Clint and Natasha and if that wasn't causing Clint's wife to be concerned, then presumably this one will not, but. Yeah, he's dedicated family man. That said, uh, Mark, if you were gonna represent people to go sue Bishop Security because of what they're doing with the in, uh, extreme surveillance, uh, uh, would you approach this from like stalking type laws or invasion of privacy? How would you attack that? Yeah, you know, there's, I, 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 thinking about this, right? You know, there's now an Israeli company that's being uh, under investigation by the US government for all sorts of uh, computer intrusion and, and technological aspects. Um, and um, I imagine there's RICO issues with respect to this company, obviously due to the organized crime, racketeering, influence, corruption, whatever the O is. I'm forgetting what the O is. Um, there's definitely privacy issues. You know, I remember there was a case a few years ago that definitely was a big news here in D.C., but it went up to the Supreme Court as well, where there was an interception of a congressman's phone call. Uh, and it was then leaked to somebody. And I, I don't think it was a, a deliberate interest. I'm trying to remember how they targeted or whether I think they actually just kind of picked it up almost on their set, you know, their radio system, on their ham radio system or something. Somehow it intercepted the signal, uh, which there can be issues with that. Uh, but there, there, was a, there is a law, I, I presume it's still on the books, about, you know, intercepting calls that are, are, you're not a party to. Obviously, every state has different laws about one or two party consent with respect to recording conversations. Uh, but it, it certainly seemed to be that what the company was involved with and the technology that uh, she was using to, for example, track Clint, which he made a comment about, uh, would, would definitely be illegal uh, and, and cross not only, I'm sure, New York State law lines, but without a doubt, federal lines. Let's continue stalking to uh, uh, well, Elena or Wylena, uh, because it keeps- yeah, do the Russian way, Yelena. Yelena. For some reason, it just, I couldn't roll it off the tongue. But uh, the fact that we have her going to Kate's burned out apartment, addressing Kate as Kate Bishop, 
knowing case GPA, parental background, uh, you, you can't just find out somebody's GPA. Like that requires work. And I, I doubt Kate had a resume on Monster uh, where- it's on LinkedIn. I mean, we it, don't know. It's entirely possible, but that would still take work. She did her homework on Kate and then hung out in her charred apartment making mac and cheese, which we can all agree is awesome. I guess it's but, unclear whether she brought it with her or somehow a, a single box of mac and cheese survived this inferno fire. I was and, just going to say that. I was like, I think she picked it up from like a corner store or a bodega because there was nothing surviving that charred out apartment. Um, certainly not one, you know, very flammable box of mac and cheese. It, it could be a Christmas miracle. Regardless, she's in Kate's apartment and being very specific uh, in a creepy way. Uh, does that raise stock, stocking alarms to either of you and, and Gabby, you first? I, I think it does. I mean, you know, she clearly here, the, you know, we see the difference between, you know, the Clint situation and the Yelena situation is that Kate is in fear from the time, you know, Yelena starts referring to her as Kate Bishop. Um, clearly she knows who she is. Uh, she got this information in, you know, seemingly a short amount of time, because I don't know if Yelena knew who Kate was prior to running into her um, on the rooftop. Um, so she knows where she lives. Um, she knows all this information about her. Uh, she knows where her, she makes a point of where her family lives. So clearly she's threatening her mother as well. Um, so Kate is very much in fear of um, Yelena's knowledge and, and Yelena's contact. Um, so there is kind of an element of, of stalking there. And obviously, um, we'll get into this, but, you know, obviously the trust, the criminal trespass of her property um, is another big thing. Um, yeah, breaking and entering, burglary, criminal trespass. Um, I, I, you could probably interpret some of what she said to be threats uh, as well um, against her well-being, uh, even though she was trying to maybe calm her and say, look, if I had wanted to kill you, you would have already been dead. Uh, which is like, uh, and, and I, I, when she said that, I remember kind of nodding along with Kate going, yeah, that makes sense. I probably would have relaxed then too. Cause it's like, clearly you could have killed me. I would have been dead. So why, why are you going to do it now? Unless you're just playing with me, I suppose. I, I would be very nervous with a, woman with that thick accent making very specific references i mean th this sounds like you know the, the the putin hit list of you know the guy's killed by a bear in his own apartment you know things that just don't happen um this this falls into that category yeah and she also knows at this point that yelena well she doesn't know that she's a recovering black widow but she you know because clint said you know now a black widow assassin has been brought into this and that kind of raises the stakes. So regardless of whether she knows what like the whole Black Widow organization is, she knows this woman is an assassin. Like that should put you on edge immediately that somebody is an assassin for hire, um, not kind of somebody you just kind of generally let your guard down around. Now I was kind of, I was thinking when she was trying, once she revealed herself to be Natasha's sister, which I presume is not, really publicly known that Natasha has a sister. We all know it, obviously. And we also know what happened on whatever, was it Jupe, where, Moon of Jupe, wherever the heck it was where Natasha died. I forget the location where the Red Skull and the, and the stone was. Uh, but I, it raised some questions in my mind. What actually is known by people on Earth uh, as to what actually happened during all of the movies that we have watched with all the backstories. Obviously, they know the Black Widow is dead, but I presume they don't know the storyline as to what really happened between Clint and her in that scene where they both were really the ones trying to kill themselves 
and sacrifice themselves and and Black Widow just was able to do it before Clinton was able to do it because clearly Yelena doesn't know that and I, pres- I guess Kate doesn't know the details either because she just knew the big picture of Clint, Avenger, they all saved the world. So nobody could explain it uh, to them. This looked Volmir and which I didn't remember and I don't think the Avengers from a policy perspective would want to admit they figured out time travel because that could be very bad big picture uh, if people knew that technology existed, uh, but you couldn't actually, you would just create branch realities. Like uh, they probably weren't gonna, so this is how we saved the world. They probably just were big battle Natasha died, but here's everyone who was involved saving the world. We're going to ignore Wakandan military forces operating in upstate New York. We're going to call a mulligan on that one and just go, thank you for saving the planet. <clears throat> but yeah, they. why would they be that public with it? And because uh, it, it just, it would get too complicated to explain and it would open too many uh, questions for people to go like, how would you get to that far in space in 2014? Like what, how did that happen? That said, knowing, explaining like Natasha sacrificed herself, that should be public knowledge uh, because it could avoid the situation of uh, someone wanting to do a revenge killing so I'll tell you, I, I'm not sure where I was in every movie, but I had no idea that this was 2023. I always thought this was present day. Where, where did I lose that to understand where did two years, how did I just lose two years of time in the movies? I have no clue. Where in which movie set that? Endgame. So the, be- the beginning of Endgame, after they kill Thanos, and it goes to black and it says five years later. So oh. Killing Thanos is 2018. And then uh, Endgame takes place in 2023. So we're now in Christmas 2023. And I admit, I was clueless. Yeah, I don't remember what month Endgame would have been, but from Spider Man Far From Home they still had to finish the school year and they, they were, when they all got blipped, it was April or May. So like they're getting ready for graduation. And when they come back, they end up having like six months of school that they need to do because of time. Cause uh, just because they were in May or April when they got snapped, looking forward to the end of the school year, they come back in like November or some other time frame so they they still have months of school <laughs> left so um yeah so i i find that entertaining but yeah well, so this I, I have an a scientific question which could implicate legal concerns actually as i'm thinking it through even in my head so this was the first time that i can think of or i'm aware of where we actually saw someone come back from the blip physically right she reappears as i guess they reverse the ashes or dust or whatever you want to call it um from the fireplace type scene and you know, she's back so i'm thinking first what if somebody had been in that bathroom when she blipped back and they were physically occupying the same space are we talking about you know a star trek um transporter gone wrong as two people beam up and a really nasty looking creature uh, em- emerges as a result. Uh, and if that does happen from a legal standpoint, is that a murder of anyone? Could it at least be a civil lawsuit against someone for that person uh, leading to the other individual's death? Could they sue the event? I mean, the Avengers should be sued for so many things for all the damage they've caused uh, everywhere. Uh, of course, Uh, and I was thinking, I was trying to remember episode four or five where the bridge scene was, and I'm like, 
okay, there's a civil lawsuit, there's a crime, there's a civil lawsuit, there's a crime. You know, at some point in time, somebody's got to be responsible for all these accidents. It, it yeah. can't be insurance gone crazy. The uh, if somebody had been there, that I, you know falls into the accident category. Um, we all there's the question of what did Bruce Banner specify in his mind for the snap? Was it people come back to the points where they were safely? Because if that's worked in there, that avoids the landing on someone. It also avoids the situation that people who are on an airplane or a cruise ship, because if you're they- You're at 32,000 feet? Yeah. Was it raining people or, or you <laughs> appear back in the plane, regardless of where the plane is or where the cruise mm -hmm. ship is, as opposed to dropping off in the Pacific? Uh, yeah which would which would suck so do you, do you get a i'm back and then die immediately i think i think we saw this i think i can answer this question um from a quasi scientific standpoint um because we've seen now three well we've seen kind of instances of people returning right loki didn't deal with anybody the snap because it kind of dealt with like you know the kind of time travel um element but we we saw people return in um wandavision, WandaVision right and we saw monica rambo and and so the way that seemed to work is that you know kind of life was operating at normal with half capacity right and then people suddenly returned and they were almost like pushed out like push like when you fill a space too much right that now there's there's not enough space right people were knocking people over and and the whole thing um, and, it, and it was chaos. And, and we see that referenced in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, um, where they talk about being displaced. So I think it was that kind of, that's why the snap had such an effect, because people were like, not, not squashed, but they were like pushed out of the way. They had kind of evolved to life at half, and then they were pushed out of the way when all of these people reappeared. Um, so I think, you know, it was just, it, it's probably, you know, very kind of wonky to think about the actual mechanics of it. But I think that goes to like a narrative storytelling, why that had more of an impact, um, you know, on a certain group of people feeling, you know, physically displaced, because they were physically, like pushed out of the way to make room for the person returning. Um, so, so I think that's kind of how, how it came to the place. But I think what's interesting about that particular scene is, is you saw, because with, with Monica, right, we didn't see that scene five years really earlier. Good. We saw it as it was happening, her um, returning, and we kind of got a glimpse of where she was, right? She was thinking of Carol um, and, you know, her memories as a child, and then she comes, she comes back. Um, whereas Yelena, we see her kind of disappear and reappear within the same second, right? Um, and so I, I think it's it's fascinating to to see that. And and there must be some sort of time between like the reverse snap and Christmas, um, because. Um, you know, you would imagine that, and I think the kids even referenced that it's been a couple months or, or something in, in the first episode, but, you know, Yelena is processing this, and this goes to your earlier, your earlier question, Mark, um, that she's having to find out, right? She's having to grapple with the fact that she disappeared and reappeared. Her sister is now dead. And I don't think that she would have, she's trying to track down that information of how her sister died as you know i'm sure a lot of people who were not close to natasha just kind of bought the oh she sacrificed herself kind of thing um but obviously you know when it's a when it's a family member that's kind of not good enough she wants the details and so she's very it would seem very um easy to be manipulated as you know we see hawkeye mentioned in this episode when grief and and anger and um is very easily manipulated and that's what she's Valentina, right? Valentina is the one who suggests the man responsible for your sister's death. She doesn't say like, you know, Clint killed your sister. responsible. 
and Yelena kind of runs with that. Um, so she's very susceptible to manipulation. Um, and it's only when she starts talking with Kate that she kind of puts the brakes on that and says, oh, wait, maybe, you know, let me kind of think about this for a second. Well, you know, so I, I guess it's, it's unclear, obviously, from the storylines we've seen as to the exact extent to which the Avengers knew that snapping with the glove, bringing everybody back, how would that look? But, you know, kind of thinking that through, and because there's lots of things where they, you know, they just don't think things through, whether it's in the comic books or <laughs> in, in the movies, of whether or not there's any duty to warn people of what could take place or taking any type of precautions. Because, I mean, I was, when I saw that scene, I'm, I was immediately thinking Star Trek transporters, just, well, that would be really messy. But, Josh, the point, that you bring up, what about the people that were on the planes and the ships or involved in any number of things that when they blip back, they're dead. They're, they're about to just die uh, unavoidably. And wow, what a nightmare. I would love to know whether the Disney writers even thought about that as they were writing the Yelena scene. I mean, they're, they're probably never, ever going to address that scenario to explain it because there's no way they could. It would be a nightmare because clearly thousands of people are going to be killed by the Avengers bringing everybody back. I guess it's a greater sacrifice, right? The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one uh, type thing. Uh, but I wonder if they thought about it. Or at some point in time, we need to ask one of the writers, <laughs> you can contemplate what that would mean. Or you just went, eh, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to, you know, take it yeah. to that. Banner is supposed to be one of the smartest people on the planet. So, <laughs> I would say in the comics, he is, and he came really close to figuring out time travel. But I would, I would postulate he thought about it, and it might have just been in a very basic term of bring people back safely where they were, some kind of, uh, and he admits that he tried to bring Natasha back but um, it didn't work. Uh, so I would, I would think he, he thought about it uh, before making the snap. Well, uh, when everyone came back in Endgame in that final battle scene, I'm just trying to remember, was it because Doctor Strange brought them all together yeah. at one? Because they obviously, now that we know you reappear where you disappeared, clearly that wasn't where they all disappeared and all of a sudden they're all together. So yeah. I, 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 Dr. Strange yeah. had disappeared, if I'm right. Yeah. And Peter, Peter mentions that when he's brought back, right. That's when he goes, when Tony gives him a hug that he's like, you know, we were there and then, you know, we weren't. And then suddenly, you know, Dr. Strange is doing the, this thing to bring them from uh, Titan where they theoretically reappeared. Um, and then, you know, obviously bringing all these people, obviously from, you know, uh, Sam and Bucky, because if you notice the portals, chunk them together with who was there, right? So you see out of the Doctor Strange portal comes Mantis and Peter and, and Star-Lord. Um, whereas the Wakanda portal, you have, you know, Black Panther, you have Bucky, um, Sam, all of them come out of the same portal, right? It's not like, you know, kind of different. Although they do have the kind of some of the Wakandans separate. There seems to be two separate Wakandan portals, but that may just be by virtue. They were like, don't run across the field, which we'll is like come out of this portal. Well, that, that's is your kidnapping. Is keep, that kidnapping? Yeah. Keep in mind, Strange had to get Wong and all the other sorcerers to assist with opening portals. So you have all of the, the magical army as well that's assisting with the uh, operational logistics, like their sea lift command and <laughs> getting the, the armies to where they need to be. But you brought up Titan. That means uh, the, the, other, the other factor, it's not just like planes, trains, and automobiles moving, it's planets. So it's not like people reappeared in the vacuum of space 
and then explode horribly. They appear in the physical location where they were on the planets that they were on. And we just, we just haven't seen people who were on moving objects uh, come back. So if a, you know, airline pilot, well, we saw planes crash because pilots disappeared. Like, where do they reappear? Do they reappear on the I ground? Saw a helicopter crash, I remember. Yeah. So aircraft go down. So do they, again, we don't want it raining people. I think the Hulk would have thought about that. So we don't have horrid deaths taking place with what the hell just happened to me? Why am I falling? Or why am I now treading water? Uh, hoping somebody comes and finds me. So, cause that's a rough afternoon. Uh, but that that's a long way to, to bring up the point that uh, lo, uh, we see the paint change in the bathroom. And it's not like a snap with it's like the bathroom's different. It's like the paint's changing and, and Wilena looks around and like sees the change happen. That's just, I was not expecting that visual because uh, Monica doesn't get that. She just comes to in the hospital room and it's not like hospital rooms get paint jobs frequently, but it's not like she <laughs> saw the, uh, the IV pole change or anything like that. So again, it's, uh, these are details that we aren't meant to dig deep in, but, but we are. Um, good times. Uh, we do have uh, lots of trespassing uh, in this episode. And if an assassin's in your apartment, that's a trespass. Uh, there's, there's no way around that. But uh, last time we talked about the issue with when you have a former Black Widow who's out for a revenge killing, was she hired to do so? And this time around, we learned she was hired. And uh, uh, Gabby, could you take that on the legal issues with murder for hire? And I'm not talking yeah. about the Bruce Springsteen song. Yeah, no, it, it's funny because, you know, prior to this episode, you know, and maybe they're kind of retconning it a bit. Um, but we had assumed um, that Valentina was the one who would be implicated. That was obviously the post credit scene of, um, of uh, Black Widow. Um, and so, you know, what Valentina told her, there's obviously no exchange of money. Um, you know, she's just basically influencing her and kind of manipulating her and saying, you know, how would you like to, you know, um get you know revenge on the the man responsible uh for your sister's death and she just hands him the picture hands her the picture of hawkeye and and really you know that would be valentina's defense is oh i just i just gave her a name like i didn't tell her and you know i didn't you know order her to go kill anybody um whereas it seems from what yelena is saying in this episode somebody affirmatively hired her uh to take out clint um and she is merely kind of a weapon that is being used. And so we are more in, although Yelena could be lying and just following Eleanor and saying, this is the person who hired me, uh, right? Because we don't know why, we already know Yelena was following Eleanor. So like, why would she not know that Eleanor was the one that hired her um, unless she's saying that Kingpin was the one that hired her. Um, but that all being said, we are kind of more into um, definitive murder for hire territory. And, and it's important to note there's a federal um, murder for hire charge if you're dealing with crossing interstate lines um, and dealing with interstate commerce. Um, so you're hiring somebody in one state, um, you know, you hire somebody in New York to kill somebody in Connecticut, that's you're implicating kind of the federal um, murder for hire statute, uh, which is 18 USC 1958. Um, and so you're intending for a murder to be committed in violation of state law um, and the murder is actually committed, right? So you either have attempted murder for hire or murder for hire. Uh, it depends on whether the murder was actually, um, and it's important to note this is separate from a murder charge, uh, which would also kind of, um, and conspiracy to commit murder. Um, but there's also in New York, uh, there's criminal solicitation, right? 
So you are guilty of criminal solicitation in the second degree um, when you intentionally um, have another person engage in contact, conduct constituting a class A felony, which murder is, um, and the person um, cause you cause that person to engage in such conduct. The reason it's not first degree uh, criminal solicitation in first degree is that uh, criminal solicitation in the first degree involves um, that person that's being solicited being 16 years or under. Um, so, but criminal solicitation is a class D felony. Um, and again, you would be, the person would be guilty of criminal solicitation um, and that is separate and apart from kind of murder convictions and, and conspiracy uh, frameworks. Uh, this is kind of a separate additional charge. But gonna, it seems well, like definitely Eleanor and Kingpin are, are definitely guilty of some criminal solicitation here. I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and also say Yelena's violated some federal immigration laws by probably being illegally in the country. Now, we know from Black Widow that she probably had a U.S. passport because she was pretending to be a U.S. citizen, but never was. Uh, I guess she's a Russian native by birth, uh, I suppose. I'm not sure if we knew which which Stan or anything she was from, or maybe just Russia itself. I don't recall anybody ever giving a detail on her birth uh, itself. I think that was more for Natasha. Uh, but uh, I, since now I know it's 2023, I presume the pandemic is over and she's not in violation of any COVID protocols with respect to her vaccination or quarantine, having entered the United States from a foreign country. Uh, but certainly she would have used a, a fake passport to have gotten in. Uh, presumably the U.S. government would know she's a black widow by this particular point in time. Certainly from, I think, the, from the Black Widow movie, it seemed, I would assume Black Widow, Natasha had revealed to S.H.I.E.L.D. or whoever else was still around at that point, all the list of the Black Widows, maybe not, don't know, uh, but that was a possibility. Uh, but I, I had a client who was a, a CIA case officer, uh, FBI agent who was prosecuted a number of years ago for being a Hezbollah spy, which she was not. Uh, and the, the judge really uh, lambasted the prosecution. It was a very high profile case. But what was really interesting, why she had to plead guilty to a misdemeanor was that she had a, as an FBI agent, she had illegally obtained under false pretenses her American citizenship by marrying, paying an American to marry them, to get citizenship. Lebanese refugee from the Civil War in the 80s, joins the FBI, joins the CIA, you know, sort of like Natasha, right? Starts out kind of bad, becomes this great person, this great asset for the US government, uh, and then gets turned on. And so she had an official government diplomatic passport, which she had used to travel around the world for the U.S. government, and the prosecutors charged her for using the passport falsely, and each charge was subject to five years in jail. So there was she was up to like 180 counts of improperly using the American passport. So she ended up pleading guilty to to a misdemeanor. So uh, thank you for helping her. Uh, secondly, <laughs> like yeah, all good now. Yeah, yeah. The assassins in the country, and she was visiting. I think Natasha's gravestone, I believe, in Ohio. So we do get interstate travel from that. Uh, so again, there's crossing state lines. So we can argue federal jurisdiction. Uh, but yeah, it's clearly murder for hire. And with the reveal at the end of it's kingpin uh, and Eleanor is bad. Like, okay, it makes so much sense. And uh, it also means that uh, Wilson Fisk survived the snap. So I don't know how he was able to get out of federal prison uh, post first snap, but he somehow does and is back to building his empire after the events of Daredevil season three. How that all works out, I don't know, but we're back to his, uh, uh, apartment building uh, where he has his base of operations. And uh, I mean, again, it makes sense if the spy followed the person to figure out who hired me. 
because now I have questions about why am I being used, am I being manipulated? Uh, but we now get all the fun kingpin issues of organized crime and the federal and state violations from that. And uh, I have lots of daredevil posts talking about Rico and charging Vanessa and all that fun stuff that I'll, I'll tweet out over the next week. Uh, but it's great to see that. And it makes sense if Clint uh, was getting, was targeting Kingpin. Now for the fight with Echo, did uh, either of you completely understand Clint talking to Echo about the informant and who actually tipped him off. So was Clint tipped off by Kingpin or by the number two who uh, was acting on Kingpin's behalf to target Ronan to take out a fat man's auto dealership? So the way I understood that was that Clint was actually hired by Kingpin. So you have another kind of murder for hire issue there. Um, but that that Kingpin hired him based on the words of an informant um, that he wanted the dad taken out and like the dad's like sub platoon organization, whatever. Um, and that like the informant, obviously Kazi had been telling Kingpin something to obviously tell them where where the dad was. Um, and also maybe inform him of something that would want, you know, to encourage Kingpin to take um, the dad and, and the others out. That was how I understood that. Mark, how about, what was your read on that? You know, uh, unclear. I, I imagine we're probably going to learn more about that in the final episode. Uh, you know, clearly planted, the intent was to plant the seeds within her to doubt whatever this relationship, and I guess it's never been really clear as to what this relationship is between her and the number two. Uh, you know, there's the sort of insinuations that it's beyond a working relationship, but there's no overt indications of that, but there's there's some personal longstanding relationship. And obviously now this throws that into doubt as she's trying to figure out, you know, what she should do and whether she's supposed to take revenge uh, or not uh, against Ronan in light of this. And, uh, you know, complicated for sure. And it, it, it brings back what we always say in every series we're talking about is how are they going to do this in one episode and answer all these questions? Or is there going to be a second season that, that might delve into this more? Uh, and I don't know. Uh, or will it become a graphic novel at least and the writers can then take it from there yeah what what i'm i'm looking forward to because the way i understood it is that because kazi was trying to like one up to basically take the dad's position in that kind of like sub circle of like tracksuits um and he may, you know, as a young person have been, you know, feeding lies or, or whatever to Kingpin um, and Kingpin ordered Ronan to take out that group. Um, obviously, you know, Kazi wasn't there because he was he was the informant. I think Kazi did not plan for um, Maya to take over. Um, he probably thought he was going to take over. Um, and then that wasn't the case. And we also know, speaking of their, their relationship, we know that from, from the subtitles that in the episode Echo, um, that the, the younger kid, the other kid that's at that karate, um, whatever class, um, is Kazi, the one that fights before she fights. That's it. He's credited as young Kazi. So they've known each other, you know, they've grown up together. So what I would be interested in seeing in, in the, the Echo uh, spinoff um, is seeing how she navigated, not just as a female in a predominantly male underground society, um, which is probably why Kazi assumed that she, he was going to get the gig and not her, um, but, you know, as a disabled um, female woman of color, I think that'll be 
be very interesting. And obviously we know that um, Maya in the comics is actually the first to take on the mantle of Ronan. Um, it's not Clint Barton in the comics that takes Ronan on first, it's Maya. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, um, if she takes on the mantle of Ronan, um, maybe to kind of get full circle revenge, right? To dress up as Ronan, uh, to take revenge, um, and then maybe kind of take some time as a vigilante, um, or maybe she goes straight into becoming Echo and, and not kind of, you know, kind of skips the whole uh, Ronan journey. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that factors in because we know she's getting kind of her own spinoff. So I, I imagine a lot of that may be that additional information may be told in the, the Echo series as opposed to a future season of Hawkeye. I wonder, with her getting her own series, I wonder how many people are going to learn basic uh, American Sign Language. Uh, I, I wonder if that's going to be a secondary effect, which is cool. I, I, I just, I think, will people learn it uh, mm -hmm. in order to watch the show or because of the show? So that's kind of a fun thing to... Assuming to this is even accurate as to what she's doing and that, but that's the, really sign language i hope it is i don't know i mean that is not well, that's a good question what I would, I do sign language, so. yeah what i would be interested to see and and i think it is and i, I what i find fascinating is is they kind of go back and forth between you know Clint, in that scene clint is obviously signing to her but she's also reading his lips right because they show us from her perspective of reading his lips and not necessarily focusing on what his hands are doing. Um, and they even when she's talking with Kazi, you don't always see the sign language. But the, the actress that plays Maya is deaf, does know how to sign. Um, what I would be interested in seeing uh, in, in an Echo show, and it seems like you know they've, they've really captured some of the dichotomy between how different people who are deaf view their deafness. Um, if they explore different types of sign language, because there are, there is a whole, you know, obviously there's American sign language, um, but there is also different like dialects, for lack of a better word, of American sign language. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they explore that aspect of it um, and do so in a very kind of respectful and, and um, genuine manner. Well, as, in the as comics, we... are the tracks, I, I don't, I'm trying to think if I knew of the track suits before this series. Yeah, so there's the track suit. Uh, they want to call them track suit vampires. I think they're not called the track suit mafia. Um, they are called track suit something else. Um, and what what I find, you would think that their thing for being, you know, using the term bro all the time would be very kitschy uh, when it gets translated to screen. Uh, but I'm glad they kind of kept with that and i find it hilarious the way they kind of translated that to screen um i think those moments obviously the show as a whole is, is very humorous um but i think those moments especially um were very humorous and and the way they kind of characterized the track suits um especially that first episode when they were all saying bro um was hilarious to me all, all these russians you know, the group, like, as if they're inconspicuous <laughs> in New York City. I mean, look, there are a lot of Russians in New York City, especially in Brighton Beach, in Brooklyn, but uh, that's Manhattan where all that is. And I, <laughs> and, and while, you know, they've clearly, they were humorous. And, and this kind of goes to what I was saying in the very beginning, where sometimes I actually didn't like that. Do, do I think it was all funny? The jokes were funny? Yes, I, I, I did. But it, it, not that it takes away the seriousness, which is kind of a, moronic thing to think about that this is serious in some ways like it like you can really look at it seriously either from a legal a scientific a social setting standpoint because it's just got to be you got to look at it as almost science fiction uh fantasy type thing but in looking at them i just was kind of thinking as i watched each episode and their significance grow and and the role that this isn't just some one-off little gang it's something really organized long term more sinister and yet it just seemed like they were so under the radar at least there's no indication mm -hmm. from a law enforcement standpoint that anyone knows what's going on i mean hawkeye seems to know about them there seems to have been a history maybe it was from his ronin days i suppose 
uh, with respect to who they were or are. But uh, I, the one scene in whichever episode when they were at her house where it was launched on fire, I just kept thinking, this is so public on the street. This is a nice area of New York City, from what I can tell, uh, from her apartment, at least, although maybe that's just like a, a friend's fake apartment, like from a TV show. Nobody has apartments like that in New York City when you don't have a job or you work at a coffee shop. But I'm like, where's the police? You know, we don't hear sirens in the background. We got, there's, there's nobody. Now, again, maybe it goes to Kingpin and all the corrupt New York City police that they're told, you know, don't go near it. Who, who knows? We'll probably never know the answers to those questions, but that was going through my mind. The amount of laws that these guys have violated, you know, is... The, the police force still might be restaffed because uh, if they lost half of them and then they came back, uh, they, there, there would have been turn over five years. And mm -hmm. they're, they're, um, they weren't defunded, they changed. And, and now they need to adapt to New York City being back at full population. Mm -hmm. or maybe 80% because maybe some people left after the snap and didn't come back. Uh, they, they moved to Georgia or Ohio or some other place. So there could be. We uh, never knew, of course, and we talked about this in earlier episodes for other parts of the series, whichever series it was, that right, we only know is half the population from the snap, but that doesn't mean it was evenly even. split. Right. Ninety five percent of the police force could have survived. Only 15 percent of the police force might have survived. You know, and there's no way and, unless for some reason Marvel Disney decides to write that into a story. We'll never know. Yeah, I think I think what we're seeing is kind of the general what what I like is 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 the kind of very subtle kind of storytelling that they're you know, we're continually seeing. Right. This is only a third property after after Endgame. Um, so we're, we're really seeing kind of the, the ripple effects. Um, and, and you saw in Falcon and the Winter Soldier that like the government institutions were not really well equipped to handle 50% of the population coming back. Um, they just have been scrambling. And we saw that in, in a kind of microcosm with how the hospital reacted um, in one division when uh, when the snap uh, or the reverse snap occurred, right? That people were falling all over the place, people were falling out of beds, like people were crashing into each other, like it was chaos. Um, so just imagine that for like you know, obviously, kind of think of you think of the pandemic, right? That, that it was something somebody had never we had never seen before, um, and so you know, trying to kind of develop um, systems in place to to deal with that. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting. What I liked about, about the track suits is that it created such a dichotomy between like the lower level kind of henchmen, right. And, and the kind of very sophisticated, um, you know, Jacques and, um, Eleanor and obviously what we'll see with Kingpin, um, uh, but that they're, you know, very, and he, even in Maya to a certain extent, right. They're such a dichotomy between how they operated that the it was very clear that these guys were the pawns right that these were just you know kind of the muscle and and really not uh the kind of strategist that the the upper echelon people are so i i appreciated that that dichotomy yeah crimes in plain sight are kind of hard to cover up when everyone's in track suits um yeah. and and well-labeled vans that say just a bro you're the police report's going to be super easy to follow up on with they were in a green van that said trust a bro and they were all in red track suits got them we know who, who to go talk to uh my episode five i was thinking the same thing i'm like are you guys really seriously using these same vans each time i mean come on I mean, from like organized crime, like with money laundering, it's like, okay, I get having a front business because like that's lots of crime stories have that. But to go, you're now committing crimes in them. Like one got blown up uh, by one of uh, Hawkeye's arrows shot by Kate. Like this is, you, you think there would be 
uh, the police would be hard at work on this or the feds involved by now with like, wow, something weird's going on. Uh, let's, let's send in the troops. So, but Hey, uh, that, that's where we are. And, uh, I gotta say, I, you know, like my week of going from Hawkeye to, uh, no way home, it's been a great Marvel week. Um, we'll need to figure out how we cover episode six, uh, because we're not going to record Christmas day. Uh, but the other, the other factor is what day is this now? Are we on December 22nd, 23rd? I don't think it's Christmas Eve yet. Uh, but Clint's clock is ticking to get home. Uh, so, uh, which I is mean, the other? It's still a Disney property. You got to think he gets home for Christmas with the kids. Yeah. The, as opposed to getting killed uh, on Christmas Eve. Like that's the... That'd be that'd be a dark turn for a Disney property of uh, <laughs> the folded flag arriving at the doorstep. Yeah, like that's that's just bleak. Um, but one can hope. One can hope on on how this ends. But I've been of of the Marvel TV shows. I think this is one of the strongest um, because it's an intimate story. You know, it's. Uh, you know, it's, it's grounded and, um, and which makes it uh, very different than all the others. So uh, I'm going to predict that Clint and Yelena end up bonding over stories of Natasha. That and I wouldn't be surprised if I'll go home for Christmas at Clint's house. So that's uh, it looks like a neat place for a very hallmark Christmas setting with what they have. So that that does look very picturesque of, um, uh, yeah, that'd be a good place to celebrate. So cool. Well, this has been fun and it's a nice way to kick off a Saturday. Uh, there's work to be done and other holiday prep, but uh, uh, I hope to chat with you guys before Christmas. And uh, for everyone who's tuned in, Stay tuned for more. Uh, you can support us on Patreon. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes or uh, any of the other great podcast networks that we're on, please leave a review. And everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and stay geeky.